know. <laughs> Vamos. Todos aqui. É, vamos então dar início à nossa plenária número 3, Public Space. Thomas, com a palavra. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas Coggan, uh, and I'm a, a doctoral student uh, at Fordham University at the Urban Law Center. My advisor is uh, Nestor Davidson. Uh, my thesis is about, it's called a jurisprudence of public space, and it's about understanding how judges value public space. Uh, in various ways in their judicial reasoning. Um, that's just a bit of background, though. My paper today is a bit different. Um, I'm writing, I have written this paper for an organization called WIGO, which stands for Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. And they represent the interests of those in informal employment. Uh, and just a bit of background on informal employment. Um, this includes both, the definition that WIGO uses includes both informal self-employment, so employees in informal enterprises, and also uh, workers in informal wage employment. So this includes, for example, casual or day laborers or uh, home workers. Um, the central focus in defining um, informal employment is uh, not on the extent to which the particular enterprise is regulated by the law, but rather um, those employment relationships um, that are not legally regulated or socially protected. And really the aim of WIGO is to understand how we can extend social and legal protections to those in informal employment. Uh, just to link my presentation back to the panel, which is on, on space, um, physically speaking, space is obviously very important to uh, much informal work. Um, but more than this, however, I see the urban environment as a whole as a key space for those in informal employment. Uh, not only do informal workers uh, service the city, but as I argue in this paper, the city and its resources need to be leveraged to extend social and legal protections to informal workers. So there's a symbiosis. It's not always recognized, but it exists. So this is where, in my view, the social function of the city enters the picture. Um, and we find this in the new urban agenda, which I know it has not really been mentioned that much today. We should not forget about it. Um, and I think it's important to understand what the social function of the city means from a theoretical point of view and how it can be used to um, inform the law. 
I think there's something really powerful in the social function of the city. Um, but my sense is that, A, it's not very developed, and where it is referred to, it's referred to quite in passing. But I think that it can have something quite strong to say um, about how we relate to each other in the city, and it can have an influence on the law in this regard. I think it's also important to understand what we mean by the social function of the city as differentiated from the social function of property. Are they the same thing or not? They overlap, to be sure, but I think that both the social function of property as a theory and the social function of the city both have their own very powerful undercurrents which need to be explored. I'm not sure also that the social <coughs> function of property is always that applicable within the city or within the urban environment. But I also think it's important to distinguish between the social function of property and the social function of the city because the social function of property is itself quite contested terrain. And it ranges from uh, quite radical approaches that link the social function of property to the right to the city to uh, market fundamentalism, on the other hand, which sees the invisible hand of the market as key to fulfilling uh, property social function. So you can see it's quite broad. Well, what does it mean for the social function of the city? So my paper is really about um, trying to develop this. It's also important, I think, to look at the social function of the city because the social function of property is in its origins. It was developed by this French jurist, um, Leon de Guy, um, in the early 20th century in a series of, of lectures. Its origins are, I think, somewhat shaky in terms of uh, its, its theoretical basis. So do we emphasize the, 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 the use value of property? And this is certainly something which has been picked up, I think, um, when, when it's been interpreted in, 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 in various constitutions, um, and emphasizing the use value of property. Um, but Degree himself, nevertheless, did not believe in doing away entirely with the system of private property. He was very much in favor of it. He was, he was more so concerned with uh, private property just not being used very well, or not being used particularly efficiently. So again, another reason why I think it might be a good idea to look at what the social function of the city means. So in terms of the structure of, of, of the paper itself, um, I first of all, try to ask, well, how, how do you ground the social function of the city within the law? And I'm, I haven't really answered this question, and I'm hoping for a bit of guidance here. Do we see it as, um, as a legal philosophy, as a directive principle of state policy, of state law? Is it, does it act as a kind of right against the state, against each other? I'm really not sure here. My sense is that it would be some kind of directive policy, and I suppose its position within the law would depend on particular jurisdictional context. I then go into developing the substantive content of the social function of the city, um, and I do so specifically as it relates to um, urban informal um, work. And thus far, I've, I've, I've got about four aspects. So the first one is to view the social function of the city as an usufruct, and that, of course, comes from the, the World Charter on the Right to the City, um, which was signed by a group of, I think, about 35 um, activist organizations, and they defined the social function of the city and its resources as an usufruct. I think that's a very powerful way to think about what the social function of the city could mean and how it could inform law. Because if we think about um, urban resources as something that are publicly owned, like an usufruct is, and something that is owned for the benefit of future, of present and future generations, I think that's something potentially quite powerful. 
I'm not entirely sure yet how I could re relate this to urban um, informal work, but um, I'd, I'd invite some ideas. The second aspect is that of um, social interdependence. Um, and here I, I find it quite useful to pick up on what was said earlier um, by, by, by the, 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 the reverend, where he said that um, in the welfare of the city, you will find your own welfare. And I think that one can link this quite nicely to urban informal work in the sense that much informal work involves some kind of symbiosis. So if we think of waste pickers, for example, in cities where there are no, um, where there's no um, uh, recycling, waste pickers perform a highly essential service, right? But in many cities, they're not adequately compensated for it. In fact, they pretty much rely on their own form of compensation. Um, and yet the city benefits, the city as a whole, as an abstract whole, benefits. Is this the right thing? I don't think so. And I think that this principle of social interdependence could inform the social function of the city and would, uh, for example, push for some kind of legal reform which would leverage resources in the city, tax, for example, and in a way which benefits um, waste pickers in the example that I gave. The third aspect that I, that I look at is um, is the historical and contemporary spatial context in which urban informal work um, takes place. Uh, and here, I think it's important to understand, I mean, I'll only focus on the historical aspect, to understand how present um, economic relationships within the city are historically defined and are, are, and are formed by, um, by often a history of spatial exclusion. So when thinking about some kind of legal reform program that embodies the social function of the city, um, I think it's important to take into account the historical context in which, um, in which the present exclusion takes place. And the final aspect is to think about how public and private space can be uh, rebalanced. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I see I didn't fix this particular slide. Um, but essentially here, what I'm thinking about is um, how much informal work takes place in public space or in private space and how there's often a blurred boundary um, between the two. And I think there's a need to, to, to rethink how these two spaces and how the power relations within these two spaces can be rebalanced. Um, all right, that's all for now. Hopefully we can have more of a discussion later on. Thank you. Antes de passar para as perguntas, Thomas, please. É, eu gostaria de fazer uma, uma colocação, uma pergunta, é, porque o seu, a, o seu tema é muito importante. A gente discutiu muito direito urbanístico e direito da cidade durante alguns a gente vem discutindo isso durante alguns anos e a gente está dando um passo para falar sobre a função social é, da cidade e pensando no espaço público como um, um ambiente de de convivência de congraçamento e de trabalho também e com todas essas mudanças é, tecnológicas enfim, as, as relações elas estão se modificando e, portanto, o trabalho também se modifica. E essa cidade ela precisa discutir a chamada economia criativa. É, não só a economia criativa, é, do ponto de vista de rentabilidade, mas o modo de é, proteger é, esses trabalhadores é, que fazem 
o seu local de trabalho, o próprio espaço público. Então, quando é, você fala em função social da cidade, a gente já está é, melhorando o nosso direito à cidade. E, portanto, a gente teria que estar discutindo é, sobre como o trabalho se insere nesse ambiente chamado cidade. Né? Como, como essas relações elas vão ser travadas. E, e como é que o poder público, eu não sei se no seu ponto de vista você é, concorda ou pensou nisso, como o poder público pode incentivar esse tipo de atividade, porque é uma atividade que tem um grau de informalidade muito grande, é, mas ela tem um movimento de, de, de necessidades é, e de devolutivas que são importantes. Por exemplo, os, os, aqui no Brasil a gente é, chama de catadores, né? eles é, recolhem os reciclados. E é uma atividade muito mal remunerada e não é uma atividade que tem incentivo. Então, poderia, o município poderia é, criar algum tipo de sistema, ao invés de eles ficarem com carrocinhas pela rua, é, de, faz, de colaborar com essa locomoção. É, então, dentro da sua é, pesquisa, e até que ela é muito útil, como você vê a função do, do poder público, do Estado, nessas relações desses é, empregos informais? Um, thank you. So, I would say, in, in answering your question, um, in, uh, in answering your question, um, I'd point to one of the cases, um, one of the the legal cases that I refer to in the paper is uh, was in Bogota, um, the ARB case. And that was where an association of uh, waste pickers um, took the city to court, essentially saying that they provided this essential service but were not compensated for it. Um, and the court said that, well, um, the city would have to compensate the waste pickers in the same way it would compensate a more formal uh, provider of these kinds of services. Um, and so what happened was that they, they formed themselves into a collective and, and, and as a result of the as a result of the litigation um, uh, they now recognized formally as as um, as a service provider. So I would say that's just one example of how the state could incorporate um, um, these particular kind of workers. Um, I mean, of course, waste pickers are just one um, set of informal workers that service the urban economy in various ways. Um, and I think it, I mean, it's a very difficult question to answer how the state can respond to every single category. Um, but I mean, I think it, you know, it would sort of be context specific. I wanted to ask you about uh, a kind of, uh, to, to unpack a little bit more, when you talk about the social function of the city, uh, institutionally, do you mean the city government? Um, do you mean something more broadly? Because I think it, at various points in your discussion, um, you talk about aspects of, for example, public and private that wouldn't necessarily implicate governance. And when I uh, think about the social function of property, Uh, I think about it primarily as a, a, a binary relationship between the owner and a social function property perspective places certain obligations on an owner and then certain disabilities to resist uh, in, a, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, in a kind of Hofeldian way. Um, and then on the other side of that binary relationship with the state uh, uh, gives justification for certain interventions if the social function of an owner's use of property aren't living up to what the social function, whatever the content is, whatever that might be. I think we'd had a very narrow view, Latin American view of social function property, much broader, right? But I'm, I'm really curious 
when you take this out of the context of a piece of land and an owner and the state, and you talk about the social function of the city, um, if you could unpack the kind of institutional relationships, because I got a little confused about that. Yeah, look, I mean, I'm confused about it as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 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 it's, so in, in that first, uh, uh, the, the grounding of the paper needs to be about thinking about how it could fit in um, in a kind of Hofeldian way. Um, does it create sort of certain rights? Does it create certain duties? Who are they vis-a-vis? -vis? Uh, I have been wondering if, if, if doing so is not beyond the scope of the paper, but I, I mean, I, I do think that would be, that, that would be very important. Um, but at the same time, I think the fact that there is confusion about this, um, I, think, I think demonstrates that, um, and I'd be interested to hear from, from, from Brazilians actually about this. Um, I think it might demonstrate the extent to which it's, it's, it's undeveloped as a construct in itself. Um, and, and I mean, I think, that's, I think that's unfortunate. And in many ways, I, would, I, I, see, I, I see the need for, it, for, for the beginning of a conversation, I guess, about how this can be developed quite more substantially. Um, because I think I think it has, as an idea, it has it, it has quite a bit of the potential for quite a bit of traction, to um, to rethink um, our relationships within the urban environment. But yeah, I'm sorry that my answer is not that um, that useful. I'm, I need to think about it. <laughs> Oi, uh, my name is Julia. Oi, meu nome é Júlia e eu fiz a minha graduação em Franca. Pega o meu aqui. Salva a gente aqui. I can speak in English too. Okay, Brazilian is fine as well. Please. Eu fiz a minha graduação, meu curso de direito em Franca, numa cidade aqui no estado de São Paulo, que é era uma cidade que era um polo calçadista, né? Tinha muita fábrica de sapato. E em um determinado momento, e empregava muitas pessoas, e em um determinado momento essas fábricas começaram a quebrar e remanejar a sua forma de trabalho, e aí passaram a ter a, o que eles chamam de bancas de pesponto. Eles começaram a terceirizar, a quarteirizar a, a, a produção, e as máquinas, o maquinário das fábricas, foram para dentro da casa das pessoas. E aí tem toda essa questão né, do barulho, né, da, 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 da poluição, das coisas que causa para a vizinhança e para dentro da, da, da própria residência das pessoas. Enquanto você ia falando essa relação do espaço com o trabalho informal, eu lembrei dessa questão de Franca. Assim. Não sei se tem muito sentido, não sei se você acha que vale fazer um comentário sobre esse tipo de relação, assim, de quando as fábricas acabam invadindo um espaço que é residencial, e atrapalhando todo o entorno. Yeah, so I suppose one of the issues that you raise there is this distinction between public and private space, because one could say that these workers within, you know, within their home are sort of working within a particular private realm, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure you could really make that argument, um, it's you know it's, it's up for a lot of debate. Um, I think if I you know if I were to apply my thinking here, I would I would look at the kind of service that is being provided um, to the broader urban economy as a whole, um, and I think the argument would be that the that there is probably a contribution to the urban economy in some way, and yet they may not be compensated adequately, so or, or protected adequately, right? So then, can the resources that the city provides that that are, that, that, that is inherent to to the urban environment, that is like part and parcel of the urban environment, can that be leveraged in some way in extending 
legal protections to and legal and social protections to to, to these workers. Um, I mean, it's uh, I I guess I, I I don't know if 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 the argument would work, um, but that that's I would say that that would be that would be my line of inquiry. Um, I think it's easier to make an argument about about the waste pickers, for example, um, whereas maybe you know. Uh, maybe you could say that shoes are important to our lives in the city, right? <laughs> um, that you know, if that because that because people need shoes to survive in the city, that there is some kind of reciprocal benefit. But maybe it's a far-fetched argument. Olá. Yeah. É, boa tarde. É, meu nome é Amanda. Boa tarde. Meu nome é Amanda. É, e, na verdade, eu queria fazer alguns comentários sobre essa apresentação, que eu achei muito interessante. É, primeiro que, há alguns anos atrás, eu trabalhei... É, como eu sou advogada de formação, então trabalhei num projeto social de uma ONG aqui em São Paulo que atuava com os trabalhadores ambulantes, especialmente as mulheres trabalhadoras ambulantes, ou seja, as pessoas que é, enfim vendem coisas na rua. né? É, e foi um projeto muito interessante, porque o que a gente vê hoje é que é, a última regulamentação que a gente tem no município de São Paulo para esses trabalhadores ambulantes é de 91. Né? Então, é uma legislação super defasada. E, desde então, os trabalhadores ambulantes têm muita dificuldade para conseguir as suas licenças, para trabalharem nas ruas. E uma das discussões que a gente, que muitas vezes aparecia nas, na, nas conversas entre a gente e os, e os trabalhadores ambulantes é, é, era uma questão de como que a função social, como normalmente a gente olha a função social da propriedade como uma relação entre um proprietário particular e o Estado. E como que talvez seria interessante a gente começar a olhar essa relação também a partir é, da propriedade municipal, por exemplo, né? Porque você tem uma rua que ela é municipal e é, é, ela também não poderia cumprir, por exemplo, uma função social de garantir o lugar de trabalho de, um, de, de uma parcela da população. Né? Então isso era uma questão que é, aparecia muito e era uma forma de mudar um pouco esse paradigma da função social da propriedade, né? É, a gente, enfim, não tinha nem condição de, de se aprofundar muito nisso, é, mas não sei, não sei se para sua pesquisa é uma questão que faria sentido, mas é, era um ponto que eu queria talvez ressaltar aqui. É isso, obrigada. Yeah. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. I'm definitely chat to you a bit more. That sounds great. Uh, I don't know if your work is going to uh, address the theory of the norm the legal nature of the social function of the city, if it's going to be uh, addressed by your work, uh, or if you have done it already. No, I'd want to do it. And I, I'm really intrigued by the social function of the city because once I, I wrote an article and I was talking to a peer, and he, he discussed it with me, and he talked to me, he, does, he doesn't believe that it is a principle in the sense of a legal norm. So he believes it's just a function, but he didn't, we didn't further it very much, so I, I would really want to know if you're going to address this in, in any type of uh, theory from the perspective of Alexei or Dworkin or any other scholar that works I think, this. I mean, I think I, I'm probably going to do it in terms of a Hofeldian um, analysis. So sort of set up, well, what kind of rights, what kind of duties does it create? Um, as 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 a legal concept, um, but I'm I mean I'm hoping that I could maybe find a jurisdiction which has thought about it a bit. Um, I was hoping Brazil might have the answers. <laughs> I will I will discuss a bit uh, the social function of the property, not yeah. so much the city. But uh, it's still uh, not very clear for the scholarship in Brazil about the social function of the city. Indeed, it was not very much discussed. Uh, the, the case I'm, I'm presenting next, uh, in the next panel is going to uh, talk about this, uh, this appeal that went to the Supreme Court. And one of the justices uh, 
talked, but it was really en passage, uh, about the, the social function of the city. She remembered the, the charter of uh, Athens from 1933, and she describes the social function of the city as a way of uh, as recreation uh, in um, housing, uh, circulation, and uh, working. So, uh, but it was really brief in the in the in the ruling. I'm not going to talk about this part of the ruling because of the time. But it's, uh, mm. it's uh, it was the first time I saw in the Brazilian jurisprudence a mention, a specific mention of the social function of the city. Mm. But she didn't go over the nature of it. It's fascinating. Which one, Pergunta? Please, I have. I have a question. Have you thought about the relationship between this idea of uh, the social function of the city and the right to the city? Um. So it seems that the two are often, are, are often put together within the same sort of discussion. Um, certainly the, the one author that I cited sees the social function of um, urban space within the same realm as, as the right to the city. Um, again, I mean, I, I could see the parallels, but I still have a sense that that is a bit uh, sloppy. Um, if, or messy, if that makes sense. Because for me, you know, a social, if you think about a social function, it suggests something quite, quite powerful um, that is also, that, that's different to rights. Um, and, and I think that in itself can be quite powerful. So I, that's why I really want to try explore this idea of, of what it can mean. Um, of course, it can be influenced by the right to the city, and I think it is influenced by the right to the city. But is it the same? I don't know. I don't. No. Thank you. Thank you. Agora o professor Badrinar, não sei se eu falei corretamente. Good afternoon, everyone. I thank the organizers for having me here. This was the moment I have been uh, waiting for very anxiously. I intend to inflict a long speech on you, a soporific one. This is a post-lunch session. I know many of you are sleepy, but this is going to be fun because we're <laughs> going to talk about India. Arguably, the most important issue in India today <laughs> is the question of land. Why? The answer is simple. Russia is the world's largest nation in terms of size. 17 million square kilometers, 147 million population. Density of population per square kilometer is nine. Nine, okay? Now, you go to Canada, occupies close to 6% of the Earth's land mass, 37 million population. Density per square kilometer is four. Australia, density per square kilometer is three. Brazil, 211 million people. 8.5 million square kilometers, the fifth largest nation in the world. Density of population is 25. India supports 17% of the world's population, 1.25 billion and counting. India has just 2.4% of the Earth's land mass. And India has 408 people per square kilometer. So that should tell you right off the bat what we are dealing with. You go to a city like New Delhi, fifth largest city in the world, 18.6 million population. The density per square kilometer is just 11,380. <laughs> okay, that should tell you why land has become such a big issue. 
okay? In neoliberal India, we all know that India opened its economy in the late 1980s and has since embraced what scholars refer to as the LPG thesis, not liquefied petroleum or gas. It is uh, liberalization, privatization, and globalization. India wants to join global capital. One of the most important commodities in furthering this enterprise is land, okay? Now, this project of globalization is built on several urban fantasies and ersatz aesthetics. There is this false sense of beauty that people want to see in their cities, and that requires them to uh, decongest spaces. It requires them to sanitize uh, certain areas that are ugly, and so on and so forth. And this results in the eviction of hawkers, demolition of slums, and so on, all of which is compounded by the fact that perhaps after China, India has one of the world's largest internal migration of people from villages to cities. Uh, the agrarian crisis in India is unprecedented, forcing people from villages to seek livelihoods in cities. And as that process unfolds, along with urban immiseration, we also see this push toward wanting to make cities beautiful by getting people and their settlements to vanish mysteriously, obviously with the patronage of the state and the police. So this is uh, how predatory globalization is unfolding. There are several legal strategies that have been put in place to actualize this dream. I will very briefly take you through the Special Economic Zones Act, which has resulted in what many scholars have described as the largest case of land grab in post-independent India. India became independent in 1947. We've been a republic since the last 70 plus years, and not any time before in the prior to the last three, four decades has the state been the agent of land grab through legal strategies, okay? And this is accompanied by the judicialization of politics and uh, the rise of the neoliberal state. What matters crucially is the fact that the judiciary abdicating its central role in upholding the promise of the Indian constitution. India is the world's largest written uh, constitution. It is a lawyer's paradise. You should practice law in India because it's very long, full of contradictions, lots of opportunities to litigate, okay? The US Constitution by comparison is kind of boring, but that's all right. So we find that the judiciary has uh, joined the elites in furthering the elitist agenda of development, and this has led to social exclusion, it has led to urban immiseration, and has diminished people's uh, belief in the legitimacy of institution. So this is a map of India, subcontinent. I want you to pay attention. Uh, this place has cities which look like this. This is what urban squalor looks like. However, this is what India wants to metamorphose into. We want to build smart cities in India. Now, what does a smart city involve? It involves smart health, smart mobility, internet of things, and all the rest of it. You see how good this is. The government of India has decided to create 100 smart cities. And you see the places in yellow. They are selected as the venues of this new project. The smart cities are going to be all over India. The goal is to take India into a brave new world. All of this is fine, except that we do not have either the bandwidth or the proper 
inclusive approach to pursuing this goal. And this is a very fundamental point. Indian development is primarily flawed because it does not embrace the architecture of social inclusion. There is, for instance, this great fantasy of building bullet trains with the aid of Japan between Mumbai and Ahmedabad. Now, this bullet train will cost more. It will cost more to travel by this bullet train than to fly. Regardless, we want a bullet train because Japan has it. Okay, and this means alienating people from their lands and that further results in rural immiseration. Okay, the one thing that has happened since 2005 has been the creation of special economic zones through the Special Economic Zones Act. Now this act is a piece of legislation that you should read after a heavy breakfast because it will cause you to suffer mental whiplash. Why? Look at this. We have set aside huge chunks of land. Recall what I told you earlier, 2.4% of the Earth's land mass, okay? 17% of the world's population. Land is at a massive premium, and here you are trying to alienate people from their lands in a largely agrarian society, and handing it over to private entities. And guess what? These special economic zones are special in several ways. You do not have to particularly be mindful of Indian labor laws because these special economic zones attract foreign capital. You can strategically ignore environmental laws. These are essentially foreign enclaves within India. Now, a special economic zone needs only to have 50% of the land allotted for its stated purpose. The rest of it can be for a golf course, it can be for a gated community, it can be for any number of other things. Now, these are the fantasies of the up-and-coming middle class in India. The judges of the courts, particularly the higher courts, they come from the upper middle class. These are their dreams, okay? And this is precisely why you find there are several dubious practices afoot. For instance, in the name of beautifying cities, hawkers are being kicked out. 2% of people in India are uh, hawkers. They are uh, about 10 million people in uh, numbers. They are predominantly in urban areas. These are people who have come from rural regions and they do not have uh, any means of livelihood. They are part of the informal economy. 2009, the government of India passed the national policy on urban street hawkers. 2014, the Street Hawkers Protection of Livelihood and Regulation of Street Vendors Act was passed. Both of them pay lip service to uh, these people who comprise the bulk of the rural population in urban areas, but they are being kicked out, as you see, evicting hawkers for uh, staging galas, sporting events like FIFA or Commonwealth Games 2010. All these events are inevitably accompanied by the eviction of vendors and hawkers, by the demolition of slums and shanties, and so on. Everything, I might add, with the blessings of the higher judiciary. Slums are being demolished left, right, and center. For example, Delhi sits on the bank of a river called Yamuna. Along the edge of Yamuna, there was a massive sprawling slum. This slum was where the gardeners, the menial servants, and so on, of the judges used to live, but they were summarily evicted in the dead of the night without being given prior notice. The following day, when the Supreme Court was petitioned, the judges said, who asked them to come here? Giving them an alternate site for living is like rewarding a pickpocket and dismiss their petition summarily. This is how uh, modern India is uh, operating. I will uh, end with a very small uh, instance of uh, 
troublesome development. 2006, the Resident Welfare Association of New Delhi, there are several of them, they approached the Supreme Court and said, look, there are these commercial establishments operating from uh, residential areas. This is a violation of zoning laws, and therefore, these establishments must be closed. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, that is correct. And they said, let's seal these establishments. Either you quit on your own, or your businesses will be sealed. This is called the Delhi Sealing Drive. How many businesses were affected? Just about 500,000 in 189 arterial streets. Where did these people come from? They did not come overnight. Delhi had a master plan that was drawn up in 1962. It was amended 65 plus times, often retrospectively, to accommodate the interests of land grabbers and special interest groups. Ignoring this history, ignoring the reasons why these businesses have emerged, the court unilaterally asked that these businesses be closed. It re resulted in a lot of problems. You see, cops were sent, people were rendered uh, virtually uh, devoid of their livelihoods. The ceiling drive created a great deal of problems. You see, on the left, there is a lock that has been put on the business by law enforcement. It was all done with the complicity of the Supreme Court. Important thing to keep in mind is as follows. This is the same Supreme Court of India that in an earlier epoch in the 1980s gave a brilliant, stellar ruling in what's called the Olga Telis versus State of Maharashtra case. This was a case about pavement dwellers in the city of Mumbai where about 65% of people do not have proper housing. There was a move afoot to clear the pavements of these people. The, Delhi, uh, the Mumbai Municipal Corporation wanted to get rid of them. And the Supreme Court was petitioned. The court, in an act of forensic ingenuity, invoked Article 21 of the Indian Constitution, which guarantees access to uh, right to life and liberty. And the Supreme Court said right to life includes the right to livelihood, and therefore these people have a right to be there. Unless you give them alternate accommodation, you cannot summarily kick them out. This very Supreme Court, in a complete reversal of its agenda, has now time and time and time again handed down rulings that support the dreams of the upper classes. The Delhi ceiling drive is one such thing. Again, it's been revived in 2018. Now, what does this mean? It has, of course, led to social exclusion. But the more fundamental point is, do the courts have the epistemic competence to wade into these matters? Those of you who know uh, how the Indian judiciary works, it is the most powerful judiciary in the world because the judges routinely rule through the bench. They are a marvel in and of themselves because they combine legislative, executive, bureaucratic, and ex fun all functions, okay? Through an instrument called public interest litigation. I don't have time to go into it. My friend here is already cautioning me. Important for our purpose is the court has waded into issues that it does not have the competence to deal with. For example, what kind of development should India pursue? This is not for courts to decide. It is for the legislature and the people of India to decide. Secondly, who should bear the negative externalities of development? Why should it always be on the backs of the rural migrants? Why should it be on the backs of small business folks? These are profound philosophical questions that are far beyond the ken and capacities of the court. Most importantly, the court, at least as far as my training goes, as far as I've been taught, owes allegiance only to the Constitution and nothing else. But in ruling after ruling after ruling, you will see in the paper, 
that I have written, if and when it gets published. Courts have expatiated on the superlative importance of creating the right investment climate, the need for attracting foreign direct investment, the supreme imperative of getting good ratings from international rating agencies. Since when have these things become the duties of judges? This must tell us that a very ominous process is unfolding. It is disheartening. It has led to the severe erosion of the judiciary, uh, not to mention the rise of a whole precariat in India. And it makes us wonder what the character of urban law ought to be in a context where the judiciary embraces and enthusiastically espouses neoliberal governmentality. Thank you very much. Nós vivemos problemas muito parecidos. Eu disse que nós vivemos problemas muito parecidos. As nossas realidades são muito próximas. E, portanto, discutir a função social da cidade passa a ser também muito importante. Revisitar todas, todo esse entendimento. E... A cidade inteligente ou a tecnologia na cidade é uma realidade. Eu acho que a nossa função é fazer com que ela seja a favor das pessoas. Né? Esse é um desafio que a gente tem. Então, eu só tenho essa consideração sem perguntas. Alguma pergunta? Um, hello. Um, I'd like very much to thank the work you have paid to India. I'm very honored to make this question. Um, specifically talking about India social inequalities, considering the social question you just raised, um, would you appoint any decisions from government could prevent, that could prevent actually any social exclusion to raise in your country? Could I? Um, appoint any decisions from government that could prevent social exclusion to keep on increasing in your country? Okay. Do Thank I you. take other questions before I respond? Or do I respond right away? Okay, let's okay. take other questions. Um, thank you so much for that uh, presentation. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation. Um, it, it is um, a, a very disturbing, everything that you um, mentioned. And I mean, I wonder, what are some of the solutions to these very real problems, um, especially in terms of displacement and job loss? Um, it seems as if this problem, it could also be transferable to Brazil in, in many ways and to the United States, and that perhaps it's, um, it's a cultural issue of ingrainment um, in the middle class and the upper middle class and the, uh, the wealthiest class to make them understand that it's their duty and obligation to consider displacement and job loss when creating these um, beautiful cities. Um, and um, so I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for that type of cultural shift. Um, so, I, so my own perspective is to be maybe naively so, um, very um, uh, optimistic about the role of courts in instigating um, social change. And I think that's probably because of what I've seen happen in South Africa, uh, where, where I'm from. Um, but even in India, um, I mean, I, I in, in writing my own paper, I saw a comment from someone who is I, I can't remember, he's a, he's a board member of the National Street Vendor Association, I think. 
And I mean, he was saying that the court is sort of the only body that actually listens to us. Sure, we might not get the result we want, but, but it listens to us. Um, and I think, I mean, I, I mean, you mentioned Olga Tellis itself. I mean, that is an example, I think, of, of the courts doing, you know, what, what we wanted to do. Um, but, I mean, and so, so I think my comment would be that, I, mean, I, I completely agree with you that the Indian court at the moment, the Supreme Court at the moment, is, is problematic. Um, but I think, you know, we need to understand courts as, as, as a political animal within, um, within open governance and um, that, that it's leveraged, leveraged in various ways by parties on, on both sides. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, it, uh, but perhaps then if, if, we were to look in, if we were to look at some kind of solution, it would be about sort of understanding which judges are appointed and how well qualified they are in terms of understanding the difficulties faced in the urban environment. Um, but I think, you know, as, a, as an institution, courts can be both useful and, and harmful. Anything else? No? Okay. All right. Um, let me begin with the second question. What are the solutions? How do we deal with joblessness, displacement, and so on? Well, courts are, as you all do, and the uh, system of governance, well, they are all embedded within processes of politics and society, and there is no way one can dichotomize. How do you reconcile competing interests, and who bears the externalities, and to what extent? These are very important questions. And in order to be able to answer them satisfactorily, one of the prerequisites is robust institutions, a robust state. India is a flailing state, not a failing state. It's a flailing state. In other words, it is pulled in different directions by competing special interests. And it allows itself to be suborned, to be corrupted, and to be influenced by a host of interests depending on which one of them is stronger than others. Now, in a con context such as this, being able to devise rational solutions for problems of displacement, joblessness, and so on, is quite unlikely. And we've seen this again and again and again in India. When the Narmada Dam project was unveiled, which involved building 3,000 major and minor dams across the mighty Narmada River, which flows across four states in India. There was the question of, number one, the displacement of uh, the tribal population living along the uh, uh, banks of the river. There was the question of how you would reset the government of India did not have any policy. Even today, if you go to the website of the Ministry of Commerce and Industry, you will find a policy document on special economic zones. It makes no reference to rehabilitation and resettlement of those that are affected by these special economic zones. Now, if uh, we have institutions that suffer from such ethical blind spots, we will not be able to create optimal solutions. One of the problems that people in India, the elites of the state, uh, suffer from quite acutely is they see this as a zero-sum game. In other words, if the agenda of globalization has to succeed, then someone has to pay the price and it has to be the poor. Well, it need not be like that. One can devise imaginative, inclusive policies that take care of the rehabilitation and resettlement of ecological refugees 
and at the same time pursue agendas of development that are sustainable, that uh, are inclusive, and that result in real human development. There have been several models, experiments in Scandinavia and elsewhere. There is no desire or impetus on the part of state elites to pursue these agendas because of this bull-headed, pig-headed sense that they can ram down a certain vision of development and get away with it. So that is the very big problem that we in India have. Answers question number one also, how, what can the government of India do to promote inclusion? It can do a huge number of things. Thus, for example, the government of India has invited foreign players, mining corporations and so on, given them huge concessions to mine. The aborigines living on those lands, they have been forcibly evicted. Now, people who have been agitating against these predatory policies have said, look, make public the entire deal that you have entered into with these folks. Who have you given these concessions to? For how long? What revenues will you be able to generate? Who is going to benefit? What are the negative externalities? Let us know. The government of India has not done this. All they do is they send their law enforcement paramilitary forces to evict people forcibly, to jail dissenters, call them Maoists, and shut them up. Now, if you have this attitude, if you are a hammer, everything will appear to you like a nail. And that is the attitudinal problem we face. With respect to the third question regarding the nature of the courts, yes, this is true that while the courts have time and time again in the recent years handed down what many would characterize as anti-people uh, uh, verdicts, people still go to the courts because of several reasons. Number one, the judiciary is the, at least as far as we know, the least corrupt of all the major institutions. The executive is compromised hopelessly. The legislature has been completely hijacked. The media no longer play the stellar role that they used to, and therefore people are forced to go to the judiciary. As symbolic as their uh, commitment to constitutional values are, at least they listen if only to dismiss at the end of a lengthy argument. And that is the reason why people go to courts. Now, this is also true that the same Supreme Court of India has a stellar record with respect to social and economic jurisprudence. I talked to you about Article 21, guaranteeing the right to life and liberty. The same article has been invoked, and the court has read right to education into it, right to a clean environment, right to, right to uh, uh, privacy, and a whole range of other rights. In other words, these are rights that have been instituted by the judiciary, by creatively interpreting an article of the Constitution. This means that if the judiciary applies its mind, it can indeed forge solutions to these problems. What happens, however, in reality is that the judges allow their class consciousness to be cloud their judicial conscience and eclipse their verdicts. And this is the tragedy of the courts in India. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers and the participants for some really interesting discussions and presentations so far. I want to discuss my hometown, Johannesburg, with you today. Having grown up in this racially segregated city in the post-apartheid era and worked in it 
as a public interest lawyer, I want to talk about how the color line continues to haunt the city. My main concern is with how the law operates in this racially divided city. I seek to disrupt commonly held notions about the relationship between law, space, and the legal subject, arguing that legal subjects are inextricably linked to the locations in ways that have yet to be fully recognized by law and policy makers, adjudicators, and even legal academics. In essence, I argue that there is a gap between legal theory, which is couched in space neutral terms, and the lived reality of legal subjects, which is shaped by the spaces they inhabit. My argument is based on three related points. First, space is political, a social product which we create every day. Secondly, Johannesburg space has been shaped by the politics of race and class. Finally, legal processes do not recognize the politics of space adequately and thus fail to respond to contemporary manifestation of apartheid geography. This lacuna represents a threat to South Africa's constitutional project, which is premised on advancing social justice through law. The premise of my contribution is that space is political. I follow Henri Lefebvre who argued that space is not a scientific object removed from ideology or politics. It has always been political and strategic. If space has a neutrality and an indifference with regard to its contents and thus seems purely formal, the epitome of rational abstraction, it is precisely because it has been already captured and occupied and used and has already been the focus of past processes. Space has been shaped and molded from historical and natural elements, but this has been a political process. Space is political and ideological. It is a product literally filled with ideologies. What Lefebvre articulates is a simple intuition. Space matters. This contextual approach reveals that while people shape space, they are also shaped by the space simultaneously. Viewing space as a political and ideological is a key tool to understanding the processes of segregation, ghettoization, and gentrification. This insight reveals that while space is commonly thought of as apolitical, space is more likely a reflection of social relations which are normalized and giving physical expression. Viewed through this lens, phenomena such as mass evictions, the rise and fall of property values, and the displacement of racial and ethnic groups are not isolated events, but part of a socially driven narrative which Lefebvre termed the production of space. In this site of contestation, law and legal processes play a dominant role which warrants concerted interrogation. Johannesburg is a product of racial capitalism. Locating Lefebvre in Johannesburg, a city shaped by racial and class-based spatial discrimination, reveals the power of space in social life. Johannesburg, a city shaped as a gold rush town in 1886, like the rest of colonial era, was deeply infused with racist ideology, which ran through the very fabric of society. In this racially organized context, black workers were restricted to residing in designated areas outside the city. Segregation intensified in the 20th century in response to the influx of black people from the countryside. Official policy was formalized with the enactment of the Natives Land Act in 1913, which limited the African population to rural reserves and the Natives Urban Areas Act, which created, designated for, which created designated areas for occupation by black workers. In 1933, the whole of Johannesburg was designated a white area, and by 1940, the black population had been forcibly relocated to the outskirts of Johannesburg. The city's segregationist policy was intensified with the rise of the apartheid government, and racial distinctions were made manifest with the enactment of two spatial planning laws, the Group Areas Acts of 1950 and 1966, which crystallized the racial and spatial differences by designating specific areas for each of the racial groups. This made the city a world of strangers. As Ellen Morris argues, the social impact of enforcing segregation in the urban areas was dramatic. It ensured the interracial social contact was minimized and confined to employer-employee relationships in domestic, commercial, and industrial settings. It meant that government was able to racially compartmentalize schooling, local government, and everyday residential living, and thereby encourage the development of different forms of ethnic consciousness in the city. The abolition of the Group Areas Act in 1991 
and the enactment of a new constitution premised on non-discrimination officially removed the legal barriers which had prevented black people from accessing areas designated white. Despite the end of formal apartheid, Johannesburg's social space remains characterized by segregation. The persistence of racial polarization is maintained through socioeconomic disparities which differentiate its inhabitants' access to social goods such as education, healthcare, and work opportunities. Increasingly, class is becoming the dominant axis of inequality as socially mobile black elites begin to occupy spaces previously designated white. Given the salience of space in how we organize our lives, make decisions, and categorize people, one might expect the law to have a similar concern with spatial politics. In referring to law, I adopt Carol Smart's view of law as a discourse of power. She argues that law's power is evident in its claim to a superior field of knowledge, which concedes little to other competing discourses. Thus, while there may be a range of registers and discourses available in the resolution of problems in the polis, it is the discourse of law which occupies a dominant role. This is the case in South Africa's constitutional democracy, which affirms the constitution as a supreme law. Accordingly, interpretations given to constitutional rights by the judiciary occupy a key role in the politics of space. The legal system regulates the margins of privilege and disadvantage in social, political, and economic life. In this process of translating social facts into legal issues, much of everyday experience is lost, slotted into legal concepts, leaving only legally relevant information on which judgments can be made. This creates a form of truth, with, it is with the, which, which is endowed with the force of law. This legal truth is then naturalized and distinguished from disqualified knowledge, which is excluded from consideration. Social geographers have argued that law lacks a sufficient appreciation of the nature of space. For example, Blomley and Bacon argue that the legal mentality is curiously contextual, such that legal relations obligations are frequently thought of by courts and other legal agencies as existing in a purely conceptual space with little recognition of the spatial heterogeneity or the local material context within which law is understood and contested. By casting space as inert context, the law obscures the production of space. Absent from the legal register of space means that spatial politics do not form part of the law system of knowledge. Instead, many spatial concerns such as urban land use and desegregation form competing discourses of disqualified knowledge, excluded from legal discourse per se, but regulated through site-specific rules, such as hawking, housing, and property laws. For example, property laws operate at a highly conceptual level, completely ignoring the spaces in which they're invoked. Key concepts such as ownership and possession are routinely thought of in isolation of spatial theory. Of course, this is not merely a theoretical issue, but one which has practical outcomes. My paper, which is in the Dropbox, looks at two seminal cases in South African housing jurisprudence, Krotboom and Port Elizabeth municipality. In these cases, the Epix court was called to interpret the rights to access housing and property in the context of large-scale evictions and homelessness. These decisions involve the interpretation of socioeconomic rights. However, I want to recast them as cases in which the evidence of the production of space through law and policy is illustrated. These judgments illustrate a lack of race consciousness or an appreciation of the power of geography in creating spatial problems which violate rights. While mentioning apartheid space in the South African context is almost unavoidable, the recognition of space has yet to form part of the resolution of these cases. What is evident in the judicial approach is courts noticing but not considering the power of race and space. Thus, while some categories such as disability and gender are rightly recognized to impose particular burdens on the legal subject, space has yet to be recognized meaningfully in judicial analysis. In my view, the law's non-recognition of historical and contemporary manifestations of spatial inequality reproduces harm even while the courts are seemingly trying to right wrongs. By failing to capture the importance of space in legal terms, spatial justice projects limit their potential. A more context-driven analysis of law and space is required to adequately capture the harm which is faced by the subjects of racially marked space. Ultimately, this is a critique of 
the theoretical tradition, long dominant in the social sciences, of treating context as a container in which, but not because of which, important things happen. Thank you. Temos alguma pergunta, dada a jantada da hora, eu vou me limpar, abrir para as questões. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I think it's a, a very fascinating paper. Um, I suppose I, I'm, I'm very critical of, um, well, no, not critical, I'm quite suspicious, perhaps, of the mold of what I think would be critical legal studies, which is suspicious um, of law's power to enact social change, um, which I think is maybe where the perspective, where you might be coming from, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and maybe my suspicion is, is to say, well, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree that law is an imperfect tool, but I think, w w you know, what would be, what would be the alternative um, as a system to try instigate change? I mean, if, if we view law primarily as, um, as, as a tool that acts against um, power in, in, in various ways, then I think, sure, you can say law has been unsuccessful in many instances, but there's mid, many instances where it has been successful. Um, and then, I mean, I, I'm not sure also entirely agree with your, with your view. You said that law obscures the production of space. And I mean, I think in many cases you could say, yes, that that's true. And I suppose by law, I am speaking here about um, about uh, judicial decisions, but there are. I mean, the, the Makwikana case, for example, in 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 Durban. I don't know if you you, you, you know about it, but it's a it's a case that deals with uh, street vendors. I thought the judge there was keenly a bit aware about law's impact on 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 race and how um, anti-street vendor law impacted on um, on on black street traders in in, in particular. Um, so I'm not sure, I mean, I, I could see how in some cases it would be compliant to it, but I'm not sure it's entirely true. And so I'd, I'd be suspicious about dismissing law um, in, a, in, its, in its entirety. Maybe that's not what you're doing, but yeah, that, I mean. Do you have one question? No. 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 All right. So, I think on uh, Thomas's point, um, what this project is supposed to do is not um, dismiss the entirety of um, what the law tries to do, and in many cases, um, the law has positive effects for people who are adversely affected by spatial problems. But what I want to do is move us towards uh, a thicker analysis, which considers more of the context in which these problems arise. So there may be cases where people get positive outcomes through legal mechanisms, but I think there are many opportunities uh, which we can uh, leverage by making such critiques and opening up new space for alternative ideas, uh, not necessarily um, that have, you know, this paper doesn't necessarily flesh out what's going to happen in, in the future, but I think it's a good way to open up thinking and really reconceptualize the way we think about law and what's possible. Um, and in particular, you asked, you, you're skeptical about the critique, but I think, um, if you consider that law doesn't have uh, one function, so in a case that has uh, one positive benefit, say people are prevented from um, being evicted out of a property or uh, a street vendor is uh, given access to his goods or paid some kind of compensation, then what the law says in those situations or what the law doesn't say uh, may have other effects, which I'm not sure we have yet uh, to consider uh, properly and fully. 
So I think if we open up and look at it more contextually and see not necessarily what the outcome is of the decision, but what its political effects are in shaping how people access law in present case and in future cases. Um, this comes from a critique of um, socioeconomic rights law in South Africa, which has had many positive benefits, I argue, but has really not engaged with how space in South Africa remains uh, racialized and how it's still categorized and uh, marked by the politics of race. So while the courts have done a lot to develop uh, the content of rights such as property and housing, they've missed the very important point about post-apartheid geography because the creation of the city uh, from its inception was really racialized and the courts haven't really grappled with that in any meaningful way other than as a historical context or as an introduction in the facts but in the resolution of the, the outcomes then there's really little context or consideration of that kind of thing. So what I want to do is move us towards considering the totality of uh, the circumstances and not just outcomes or you know the circumstances which they choose to emphasize. Um, like often they, they'll emphasize people's um, age, gender and disability and ign completely ignore the fact that they are in a space that is racially marked, has been made a ghetto, is a, uh, an urban slum. And I think we can do more as um, a public interest lawyer. This is partly a, a, an auto-critique because I'm involved in many of these uh, cases. I think we can do more to ad adequately capture what's happening uh, with the subjects of uh, spatial disadvantage in the city. Hmm. Okay, uh, we have some questions over here. Me first. <laughs> so I, I want to do, uh, quero fazer um comentário. É, comentário e indo um pouco assim concordo um pouco com o Raf indo um pouco entendo também as questões do Thomas mas eu acho que por exemplo a situação brasileira nós temos muita lei nós temos muitos textos não é à toa que a nossa estrutura jurídica urbanística brasileira ela é super bem avaliado. Nós temos uma, um Estatuto da Cidade, nós temos um Estatuto Metropolitano, nós temos uma Lei Federal de Mobilidade, de Saneamento, que determina e já desenha toda uma estrutura de execução. Em linhas gerais, mas tem é, os órgãos já determinados. E por que não funciona? Né? Eu acho que existem, claro, que existem uma série de variáveis, mas uma coisa que o Raf apontou que tem sido uma coisa que a gente tem investigado muito, principalmente na Prefeitura de São Paulo, mesmo é, entre os técnicos, é a questão da transparência. Não é, é, a, a existência da lei por si só ela não alcança, ela não consegue alcançar a quem realmente interessa. Então, a transparência de dados ou mesmo a facilitação de uma língua jurídica, principalmente o português, super rebuscado... É, todos esses desafios, temos leis muito boas, mas cada vez mais, é, eu pessoalmente pelo menos entendo que a apropriação da sociedade dessa letra rebuscada da lei, talvez seja uma forma de que as pessoas possam se apropriar e exigir, aí sim do poder judiciário, aí sim do poder executivo, porque sim, nós temos é, estrutura jurídica suficiente para isso. É, talvez a gente tenha falta de mecanismo. Claro que são inúmeras variáveis, mas é, eu concordo nesse aspecto de que a transferência de dados, a apropriação do que, que é o Estatuto da Cidade, do que, que é um plano diretor, do que, que é um plano de saneamento, não por nós, acadêmicos, aqui, mas por uma sociedade que efetivamente... E aí sim criar uma cultura de participação social. Que isso é uma coisa que a gente debateu muito na revisão do plano diretor de 2014, de como nós, corpo técnicos, também não estávamos preparados para exercer a participação popular, mas a sociedade também não estava preparada para entender quais eram os alcances e quais eram as demandas que eles deveriam trazer naquele fórum. Então, sim, nós temos o papel do direito não é leviano, mas, na situação atual, pelo menos no contexto brasileiro, essa 
espacialização da, social, da justiça social é, tem sido pouco transparente ou conectada com as nossas leis. Isso eu também compartilho um pouco do entendimento do Ralph. Acho que era isso. Good afternoon again. Uh, I actually want to uh, support Ralph's conclusion, or some of his conclusion, that uh, law could, law can be, uh, and oftentimes, at least in the United States, for black people, a source of oppression. Uh, I, I think when we uh, discuss law in isolation, we get into the situation where we are uh, looking at individual wins, uh, but when we look at individual wins, it actually prevents further movement uh, in terms of social justice. Uh, one win does not necess necessitate that we're fixing everything. Uh, as I tell my students in class, they have to let some black people be successful or else we'll have a riot. Uh, so in order to keep the uh, illusion of the American dream, we must allow at least some people who are oppressed to advance so that there's still this idea that if you work hard enough, uh, you can do it. Uh, thinking more about the idea of space, even in, uh, when, when we are in front of the Supreme Court thinking about space, I think to the Michigan case, uh, the Grutter case, where minoritized people were allowed, this was acceptable because we were supposed to uh, help white people understand how to interact with people of color in their future. Not that we deserve to be in law school because we just deserve to be there. It was literally justified because, well, if, you, if you're not there, how will these white people, how will these good white people ever learn to work with your people? Uh, so it wasn't justified on our win. So I, I think in each case, even if we go back to like Milligan, when we think about space, the, that, we're, that we allow people who are oppressive in one area moves, move beyond an artificial, uh, an arbitrary geographic boundary and they're cleared of their debts. Uh, we have not yet entertained, at least in the United States, not states, and I suspect, suspect elsewhere, uh, a full investigation of how we just decided that one day we're going to be very ahistorical, we're going to start history over here and be race neutral, not realizing that each and every, even when, compounds the oppression that people who have been historically oppressed face. É, a, o meu discurso uh, vai um pouco tentando tentando é, é, dialogar com o que tu falaste em relação à a, a, a eficácia normativa, eficácia da lei frente a leis tão boas quanto a que nós temos no, no Brasil. E esse discurso foi levantado é, pela manhã, pela professora, sobre que nós temos muitas leis muito boas e essas leis não são realizadas no plano da eficácia. E esse, na verdade, é um discurso que aparece muito nos urbanistas. Você vai ler os livros da Hermina Maricato. Essa é uma inconformidade que ela tem sobre por que e como temos leis tão boas, estatutos tão bons, e eles não são é, realizados. É, não seria um momento de focarmos muito mais Uh, no plano da eficácia, o que é que eu quero dizer com isso? Obviamente, não é o fato de vai existir leis boas que fará com que o direito seja plenamente realizável. Uh, o que faz com que o direito seja realizável é o quanto uh, nós, nesse ambiente democrático, exigimos, é, enquanto movimentos sociais, que ele seja, de fato, aplicado. Então, independente da existência, é, eu acho que há uma, uma eu acho que há, eu acho que há pouca pesquisa uh, e pouco incentivo sobre uh, uh, como esse direito tão bom no plano é, é, dogmático é de fato deve ser e tem sido aplicado. Quer dizer, quanto os uh, quanto os movimentos sociais têm interagido para que esses para que esses direitos sejam sejam aplicados. Quer dizer, eu, o, que eu, a, a, o meu discurso é muito no sentido de que precisamos de muito mais do que leis boas. Né? Nós precisamos começar a pensar em articulações de movimentos sociais que façam 
com que essas leis boas possam ser, é, de fato, eficazes. Porque, senão, nós só faremos boas leis e elas não terão os frutos adequados. Encerramos? Sem mais perguntas? Uh, so we are taking for five to ten break, uh, minutes break. Ok, so, uh, vamos fazer um pequeno intervalo, ten minutes. Em 10 minutos, então, voltamos aqui às 4h20, em ponto, e faremos é, os dois painéis seguidos, tá ok? Então, os panelistas que têm é, arquivo para apresentar, pode me procurar. Uh, if you have any presentations for the last four panelists, you can... Yeah.